Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. On South Dubakella Mountain in Trinity County, at about 12.30, I arrived at the Yola Bola District Ranger Office of the Trinity National Forest. I had planned a solo five-day backpacking trip to the area of Post Mountain and Mud Springs within the Trinity National Forest. I had just relocated to California from Hawaii and was eager to get back into the forest. I had seen a sensationalized Bigfoot story on a local Sacramento TV station about a group of hunters that had an encounter within the Trinity National Forest near a landmark called Mud Springs. I grew up in Northern California and the Pacific Northwest, so I knew of Sasquatch while growing up and was always interested in the phenomenon. I planned my trip carefully. Because of the time of year in fall, my relative unfamiliarity with the region and because I was making the trip solo. Solo backpacking trips need to have a carefully laid itinerary in case of problems, so rescuers have a means of finding you. When I arrived at the ranger station, I was pleasantly greeted by the staff, signed into the visitor's log, and provided them with a copy of itinerary and emergency contact information. Being a former police officer, the conversation between the rangers and I was very relaxed. We talked shop for a while. When they noted my destination on the itinerary, the rangers asked if I was going into the area in response to the Bigfoot sighting. I told them I was interested in what was seen and asked for their opinion of the sighting. All four of the rangers stated that Bigfoot was just as real as the bears, deer, and cougar within the park. Two of the rangers said they had been up to the location and found a set of tracks. They also stated that finding tracks is not all that uncommon, and that there have been casts of the tracks made in the past. I then learned that there are two locations within the park, called Mud Springs, and that my itinerary was for the wrong location. The rangers told me that many visitors were going to the wrong location and that they had not corrected them. I laid down my map and the rangers helped me plan a new itinerary for my trip to the correct Mud Spring on South Dubakala Mountain. The plan was now to spend the night in the hunter's camp and leave my vehicle there. The next day, I would set out on foot it was already too late in the day to set out. I would never make it to the second camp before nightfall, and trying to find a safe place to camp in the dark is not smart. I arrived at Mud Springs campsite a few days later at about 1400 hours. The site had obviously been used by hunters. There was a four-inch diameter wood pole lashed between two trees at a height of about seven to eight feet. It was obviously used to suspend the deer for gutting and skinning. There was a large firing that had recently been used and the normal debris that idiots leave at campsites, burnt tin cans, nylon cord, and the like. After setting up my tent and gathering wood for a fire, I walked over to the spring that was about 30 to 40 yards away. I was very impressed by the amount of water that was trickling from the spring and the abundance of animal prints, droppings, and scat. This is obviously the main watering hole in the area. Early autumn is typically the driest time of year. Streams, creeks, rivers, and lakes are all at their lowest level. The water from the spring only flows down from its source about 50 yards before disappearing into dry sand and rock. My impression was 
that if all the other animals come here to drink, so does Biggie. And with the hunter's campsite so close to the spring, that may be why Bigfoot was displaying such aggressiveness. That spring might serve as both a hunting ground and his water supply, both of which are valuable to a nomadic creature. The whole area was extremely quiet, even in late afternoon and dusk, when many animals begin to venture out. I saw only two ravens and a couple of blue jays the entire time I was there. No squirrels, no deer, and no noise. As many of you know, the forest has solitude, but is far from silent. I had made a small fire that evening. I do not normally make a fire when backpacking, but because I had a fire ring available and a plentiful supply of deadwood, and it had been years since my last trip, I decided to enjoy one. I turned in at about 2150 hours and was asleep within minutes. At about 2230 hours, I was awakened by the sound of a large snapping branch. It was not a branch falling, and the branch gave a cracking noise that made it sound like it was a thick branch. Even though my eyes snapped open with sound, I just laid in my sleeping bag listening. I didn't move. Then, with my head close to the ground, resting on my ground pad, I heard it. Not the clop of hooves or the padding of paws, but the dull, vibrating thud of footsteps. I nearly defecated in my sleeping bag. I was keenly aware of what I was hearing, and I could feel the adrenaline in my veins. The footsteps were to the northeast of my tent, when first detected. My hearing was trained in that direction because that is the same direction I heard the branch snap to. I estimated them to be 10 to 20 feet away, judging from the vibration and sound. Two more steps, and the thing making them was in front of my tent, about 5 to 10 feet away. Then the footsteps faded to the southwest. With two more footsteps, I was laying there, scared to death, thinking about what I was going to do, when all of a sudden, my pots down at the kitchen moved and clanged together. I was not imagining anything now, and I knew it was not a dream. I grabbed my headlamp and illuminated my tent, trying to drive off my visitor. After I waited about two minutes, I looked out of my tent and saw nothing. I pulled on my boots and walked to my kitchen area. There, I found my nested cookware pots, unnested and spread out. Whatever unnested those pots had thumbs. That was all the evidence needed to convince a former policeman and combat-hardened Marine that he was out of his element at the moment. And I had only been chased out of a campsite once before, and that was by a mama grizzly and her cubs in the Silver Skagit Valley of Washington State. This was far more terrifying. The pots and pans were sitting next to my backpack. I left it outside the tent near the kitchen and bear bagged my food in a tree about 50 yards away to prevent bears from coming into my camp. The backpack was brand new and did not have any food odor in it, and since there were no squirrels or evidence of rodents, I just left it on the ground propped against a log in the kitchen area. The pots were about two feet away from the backpack. After dropping my tent and rolling up my sleeping bag, I went to put them in the lower portion of my backpack. When I reached for the Velcro closure, there was a big hair stuck to the Velcro. The hair, which is in my hands now, as I write this, is approximately five and a half inches long from root to tip and dark brown in color. As you get closer to the tip of the hair, the color changes to a reddish orange. It is somewhat coarse in appearance about three times the diameter of a human hair. I collected the hair and placed it in a Ziploc bag. I threw everything in my Ford Explorer and drove all the way to Red Bluff before I finally calmed down. It is not something I will ever forget. 
the silence of the area and the lack of animal life despite droppings and prints around the spring. It is a pine forest in a very mountainous region of the Shasta Trinity National Forest. The altitude is about 5,700 feet. The forest floor is mostly spongy pine needle dust that does not yield footprints. On to the next one. I live in Cartridge County and at the time work in Sneeds Ferry in Onslow County, and the commute to work every day took me through Camp Lejeune via the back gate as I made the turn onto Highway 17 off Highway 172. I noticed what I thought was a bear sitting down under a huge pecan tree on the right since there was about 50 or 60 feet distance between me and the bear. I decided to pull off to the side of the road and watch him for a minute. It was a warm July morning, and I had the windows of my truck rolled down as usual and noticed the most ungodly smell I had ever experienced. It was kind of like rotten eggs mixed with sewage and sulfur. As I sat and watched, I quickly realized that this was no bear. As the creature stood up from the crouched position, walked over to the pecan tree, and began shaking it. I was floored by what I was watching. Understand that this tree is immense, and the creature had no problem shaking the pecans from it. Pecans that are still in the green holes, by the way. I wanted a better look at it, since the whole sighting was with its back to me, so I put the truck in first gear, ready to bug out if need be, and blowed the horn. It suddenly stopped and completely froze still with its back to me. It stayed like that till I laid down on the horn about 10 seconds later and it slowly turned and looked right at me. That's when my heart decided to do the 50 yard dash in 2.3 seconds. I couldn't see its face that well, but it stood about 8 to 10 feet tall hair was long and matty. It stared at me for what seemed like an eternity and made loud screeching noises and tore off into the woods. The sprint from the trees to the woods was about 30 yards or so and it took him no time to reach them. I'm talking split seconds. On my way home that day, I decided to stop again and though the creature was gone, I could still smell that ungodly mix of stench. To this day, when I pass by that pecan tree, my heart races. About eight hours later, I went by and I could still smell it. It was about 6.50 a.m. Lighting was sufficient enough that I needed no headlight. The conditions were calm. It is a wooded area, mostly pine and nearby swamp area. The Atlantic Ocean is about three quarters of a mile as the crow flies. On to the next one. In Berwick, in Kings County, in Nova Scotia. In April, many individual witnesses saw an 18-foot-tall hairy humanoid that was reported seen striding around the edge of town at speed up to 20 miles per hour. This creature was seen by many individual witnesses. On to the next one. Near Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, in September, in the Cobequid Mountain. This mountain range stretches from Turo to Cape Chineco, where the headwaters originate in the mountain lake and springs flow toward the Minas Basin, spilling over encampment created by major fault lines in the rock. The abundant rivers found along this coastline can be traced inland to many spectacular waterfalls in the area. Early morning, the closest road was about a half a mile away. Two local men who picked up garbage spotted a thing they described as a Bigfoot at the local landfill. It was at the edge of the woods, and they said it was at least eight feet tall and massively built. There are black bears in this country, 
Both men swore that this was no bear. It watched the men for about 30 seconds only and then retreated into the hilly thick woodland. The creature was said to be eight feet tall and at least 500 pounds. These two men are both now deceased. On to the next one. During the summer of 1835, a young man was picking berries outside of Bridgewater Township in Susquehanna County when he heard a sudden noise from a nearby thicket. The boy stood frozen, scanning his surroundings, and he heard the sound again. It was a whistling noise, and he spun around to face it. He was shocked, and only a few feet from a small, black, hairy creature that was the height of an eight-year-old boy with its entire body covered in coarse hair. It walked upright on two legs, and to the boy, it appeared to be a juvenile. They stood and stared at each other, and it gave out another whistle, which seemed to break the tension. The creature then turned and ran off, and the young man turned and headed home. On to the next one. In Silver Lake Township in Susquehanna County in Pennsylvania, in the summer of 1835, this was two weeks after the Bridgewater sighting, a 16-year-old boy was frightened by seeing a small, black-haired Bigfoot the size of a seven-year-old boy when he was sent to collect firewood. The creature was whistling, and the boy was shaking with fear too much to shoot it. They stared at each other. The boy stepped toward his gun and grabbed it, brought it up, and fired off a shot. At the same time, the creature jumped behind a tree and ran. It even whistled while it ran off. The boy was traumatized and burst into tears every time he tried to explain it to his father. There are no native apes or monkeys in North America. On to the next one. Monday, August 19, 1839. The Carrolltonian. Whistling childlike creature covered in hair. Something like a year ago, there was a considerable talk about a strange animal said to have been seen in the southwestern part of Bridgewater. Although the individual who described the animal persisted in declaring that he had seen it and it was at first considerably frightened at it, the story was heard and looked upon more as food for the marvelous than as having any foundation in fact. He represented the animal as we have it through a third person as having the appearance of a child seven or eight years old, although somewhat slimmer, and covered entirely with hair. While picking berries, he saw it walking toward him erect and whistling like a person. After recovering from his fright, he is said to have persuaded it, but it ran off with such speed, whistling as it went, that he could not catch it. The same or similar looking animal was seen in Silver Lake Township about two weeks since by a boy some 16 years old. We had the story from the father of the boy and afterward from the boy himself. The boy was sent to work in the backwoods near the New York state line. He took with him a gun and was told by his father to shoot anything he might see except persons or cattle. After working a while, he heard some person, his little brother, he supposed, coming toward him, whistling quite merrily. He said it looked like a human being covered with black hair, about the size of his brother, who was six or seven years old. His gun was somewhere a little distance off, and he was very much frightened. However, he got his gun and shot at the animal, but trembled so hard he could not hold it still. The strange animal, just as his gun went off, stepped behind a tree, then went off whistling as before. The father said the boy came home very much frightened, making due allowance for fright and consequent exaggeration. An animal of a singular appearance has doubtless been seen. What it is or whence it came is as of yet a mystery. 
On to the next one. Back in the early 1980s, Jerry Walker lived at Gibbonville, Idaho, near the Montana border. One day, she and her roommate were out hiking at Sheep Creek in the early spring when they came upon some Bigfoot print. What made her notice them was that they were barefoot and in snow. It looked like it was running, she said. The track went right through a stand of lodgepole trees. She said the tracks were most likely made the night before because it hadn't snowed for a few days. Her roommate took a picture of Walker's foot clad in her huge muckluck inside the print. Even with the muckluck, her feet were dwarfed. She figured they were well over a foot long. She reported the sighting of the footprint to the ranger station. However, they tried to convince her that what she saw was elk hoof print. I knew what I saw, she said, and my roommate saw it too. Besides, an elk wouldn't run straight through the trees set that close together. By the time she could have gone to the same area again to show anyone else, it snowed again. Walker said that she had lived in this area of Idaho about 25 years. When she mentions the tracks, there are other older woodsmen who simply nod. They know what she saw. On to the next one. It was during the summer of 2017 that Wes and several friends went on a seven-day backpacking trip through the Frank Church Wilderness near Salmon, Idaho. There were five of them, including one father-son team, and they were well off the beaten path one night when they stopped at a lake without a maintained trail. There was another backpacking group on the other side of the lake, so they camped opposite from them to give them some space. It was obviously an area that wasn't used often. There were no amenities and no indication that anyone traveled up this way. They started setting up camp and eventually ended up sitting around the campfire for the night. Just when they thought everything had settled down for the evening, they heard a huge knock coming from an area close by the camp. One of our group was a Boise policeman who wondered what we should do. Wes said, we finally decided not to do anything to just pretend everything was fine. Eventually, we picked up our area and went to bed. Wes said he wasn't quite ready to settle in for the night. He decided to take a walk down by the lake on the side away from where they heard the knock. He intended to bring a bucket of water to extinguish the fire. But as he made his way down to the water, wearing his headlamp, he saw a large figure run across in front of him. Immediately, he turned around and went back to his friends and said, I saw something and I think some of you should go down to the water with me. Wes said he usually stays up later than the other hikers. However, this guy in the tent next to him started snoring, so it was hard to settle in this particular night. I wasn't asleep yet when I heard another yell right outside camp, Wes said. Immediately after that, I heard someone human-sounding scream. So I jumped out of bed to check the situation. He said his 16-year-old son had a nightmare that night, but he wasn't sure if that was what triggered the scream or it was the result of the other scream he heard. Either way, no one wanted to go out and check. Later that night, the Boise policeman texted him and said, Now I believe in Bigfoot. On to the next one. Most of my experience have been on the Montana border near Loxa. Shane Hayes said he said he was following a mule deer with his brother. When they drop into a draw, the trees started shaking around them. Then the screams began. It was a long, raspy scream, he said. It repeated over and over, guttural with an excess of volume. They didn't know what it was, but they decided they didn't want to know. In the same general area, we heard a long yell like, Hey! Drawn out 30 to 45 seconds. The cattle around us would go quiet and still. My brother saw flashes of light and we both heard laughing like a hyena. 
It was eerie, and it didn't feel right in that area. I don't go back there myself anymore, he said. Over the course of many years in the mountains, he has found several structures. He hasn't really put a lot of thought into who built them or why they were built where they were. Bigfoot is kind of a guilty pleasure. Looking for evidence of Bigfoot while staying out of their way keeps me happy and productive. I don't think about what they are. I just tend to avoid them. During another trip on the Lock the River in northern central Idaho, they were floating in an area where the coast included large boulders that had rolled down the mountain. Opposite us, several big boulders began rolling down the hills. For a good 10 to 15 minutes, we could hear rocks rolling loud enough to be heard over the sounds of the river. He was fishing for salmon, while his cousin who was with him made a whistle out of leaves and actually got it to whistle clearly enough to be heard over the running water. After a bit, he received a responding whistle from across the river. The hillside was covered with boulders and heavy trees, so they couldn't see what was responding to them, but he is certain the responder was a Bigfoot all the same. On to the next one. Rick has been an outfitter and guide in Idaho for over 45 years. Back in the early 70s, he was working with a team of men who were core drilling, installing new water lines up Iron Creek near Elk Bend. Rick said he paused for a moment to straighten his back and happened to glance across the canyon. He said he saw a big, dark being, nearly black, walking through the snow on the other side of the hill. Every time it lifted its feet, the snow would roll down the hill in little snowballs. He wasn't sure how tall it was, but estimated it was at least eight feet tall, owing to the fact that it was walking in snow easily three to four feet deep, and it was only sinking in a little above its knees. I remember thinking how tough it would be to walk in snow that deep. At first, we thought it was a bear, but it was walking upright. The two men with him agreed it was probably a Bigfoot. The next spring, he returned to the same area to pick up the old water line, taking along his wife, their son, and the family dog. When they arrived at the same area, the dog went crazy, barking and growling. He wanted to protect Rick's son by pushing the little boy towards the pickup. The dog then crawled under the truck. I didn't see anything, but that doesn't mean there wasn't something there. They left pretty soon afterward. It just made him nervous to be up there. On to the next one. It was a beautiful day in July 2010 when Damon set out to travel from Boise, Idaho to Joseph, Oregon on his motorcycle. I wasn't in a hurry, so I took all of the back roads. I don't know if you've ever ridden a motorcycle, but you spend a lot of time looking at and evaluating the road ahead especially since the road was a paved forest service road. It was the middle of the week and Damon had the entire place to himself. He was surprised at the plentiful vegetation. It looked kind of like a rainforest. As he gained elevation, he noticed the area became drier with more pine trees. He was traveling on a flat stretch of road about 7 p.m. with terrain rising on the left of the road and falling away on the right side. Straight lodgepole pines lined up almost metrically. He was checking the road ahead when he noticed something dark move in the tree in front of him. He slowed down, and there, in a ten-foot gap in the trees, he saw his first Bigfoot. This particular Bigfoot appeared for a moment, then disappeared, then reappeared. His back was to me, and he was standing in the barrow pit, even sitting on the road above him on my motorcycle. He was much taller than I. He was dark gray with broad shoulders. His arms hung straight down. The length of Bigfoot's arms surprised Damon, and the shape of his head wasn't what he expected. I stopped my bike about 15 feet of where I had seen him and yelled, very clever. I wouldn't have seen you if you hadn't moved, he said. I walked back to where I'd first seen the Bigfoot, but nothing was there, 
and my adrenaline was wearing off. Damon stood there and looked around. He then heard big, heavy footsteps going up the hill behind him. However, he didn't see the Bigfoot again. A while later, while camping in McCall, Idaho, he thought he heard a Bigfoot in the middle of the night. I heard a long, drawn-out whoop across the trees, he said. I couldn't see anything, so it might have been one. Then again, it might have been some youth out there just watching around. On to the next one. My father and I, along with one of his close friends named Chuck, were hunting along the San Pedro River, off of Charleston Road, midway between the Sierra Vista and Tombstone. I was only nine years old at the time, but still can recall the event of that day. As we were walking along the river, not really a river, but more like a large creek, we came to a sudden stop when we heard this animal or thing scream so loud that it made me freeze. I looked at my father to see that he had turned ash white along with his friend Chuck. My father quickly changed out his shotgun shell for a magnum load. We beat a hasty retreat out of there and called it a day. The scream I remember was a very loud single scream that lasted for maybe five to seven seconds. My father and his friend, who are very experienced hunters, had never heard of any animal in all the years they had been hunting sound as this did, dying or alive, to include mountain lion, bobcat, coyote, bear, or anything else. At the time, I did not know that my father's friend Chuck had seen movement in some mesquite trees about 30 yards away from the direction of the sound was coming from. As we departed the area, Chuck saw large footprints in the sand of the San Pedro River. I'm not sure how he did not see them before, I have told this story to many of my friends and to my wife and kids with the same reaction. Nice story. Anyway, I retired from the military in 2003 and moved back to the Sierra Vista. One evening, while at the Veterans of Foreign Wars, with my friend and wife, I ran into my father's friend Chuck. I could not believe it. After shaking hands and all the formalities, we caught up on old times. The Bigfoot story came up and I had Chuck who is now in his early 70s, tell the story without my interference to my wife and friends, and he recalled the events of that day pretty much the same way I had been telling it for years. I felt a bit vindicated that our stories jived and that I was not making this up. I really don't know what it was all those years ago, but I do remember the very sound scream this thing made. Hearing the scream together with the footprints in the sand, I suppose equate to a Bigfoot event. I'm not sure, but I know what I heard. On to the next story. My wife and I, with our three-month-old baby girl in the back seat, were traveling northeast on Highway 40 on Route 66 through the mountains near Flagstaff in Arizona. This was right in the middle of a snowstorm. I stopped to read the map and reassure our direction. While looking at the map, I turned the rearview mirror light on to help me see the map. In the mirror, I caught sight of a huge, man-like figure running up behind the vehicle. I turned to get a better look, and my wife turned too. She screamed, oh my god. It was clear to see a huge, hairy, black and brown furry being. It was very tall, with a large head and long arms running on two feet toward our vehicle. There were no other vehicles or tracks in the snow. There were large pine trees bordering the highway. It was dusk and snowing pretty good. I hit the gas and we got out of there. On to the next story. I was attending the Fenster School in the north part of Tucson off Sabino Canyon. I would routinely skip a class on occasion or have a class canceled, so I would hike the surrounding area in the time frame I had usually from an hour to two hours. I would look for Indian artifacts and watch the local wildlife, occasionally seeing coyote, mule deer, or javelina. I can't forget, like it was burned into my mind. As I was poking around the old corral that was north of the campus, at least a good half mile or more. First thing that bothered me 
was my hair stood on end, and then a pungent smell hit me. Then I heard it. I saw it through the Cressoto bush, a large, grayish-brown, hairy creature crouched over a gopher den, digging at it. I was perhaps fifty yards away and stood in total fear and shock for what seemed like an eternity watching it dig with what looked like its hands. It then started to turn towards me. That's when I bolted and ran as fast as I could run, back to the campus across open ground, a former polo field crossed by an abandoned airfield for light aircraft. I kept looking over my shoulder as in panic as I ran off to see if I was being pursued. I wasn't. When I got to the office, I immediately reported what I saw to the school secretary, even drew a quick sketch of what I saw. She said she'd reported to the authorities. I told a few others what I witnessed. Most thought I was nuts, that Bigfoot lives in Canada. I refused to return to that idea for months, not venturing far from campus and especially with someone along. I would later gain enough courage to go into Sabino Canyon, especially with others. I saw or heard nothing. Later in the spring, I was again looking solo for artifacts east of the campus when I found in a wash large footprints shaped depressions based a good five feet apart, crossing the wash. Later, walking along, I looked around immediately as fear rapidly creeped again, but heard, smelled, or saw nothing. I took branches over and covered up five of the tracks and returned to campus. This time, I told a teacher of mine what I found. The next day, I took him to the site, a good 45 minutes to an hour hike, and showed him the track. He, too, felt something big and upright walked that area. We discussed it with a few others. They all felt it was a prank, clearly. Why would anyone go to the effort to make such tracks so far out and so unlikely to be found? It's been 25 years, and I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I also noticed the smell. It was very pungent and strong. And I smelled this minutes before seeing the creature. The creature was hunched over, but even then it was big. After my sighting, I don't know, maybe some students went to go look. I know several wouldn't venture to that area for weeks. Mount Lemon, at the top of Sabino Canyon, has had tales of Bigfoot. On to the next story. I grew up in Arizona and was always crawling around the woods, backpacking. I was a Boy Scout and we spent a lot of time getting into the back and beyond where the average camper and most day hikers simply didn't go. One of the big experiences is a 50 miller of foot, where you go 50 miles both hiking and floating like a canoe trip with portages. In Arizona, we didn't have much canoe water, so we made do. We hiked west clear of Creek Canyon and tougher than hell area to get into and out of. The trail was the bottom of the canyon and creek itself, to continue downstream, we inflated air mattresses and swam, pushing our backpacks on the mattress. When we reached ground again, we deflate and press on. Needless to say, this meant the area was virtually human-free. We saw several bears at surprisingly close distance. Bears that looked right at us to say, what the heck are you, before scooting away. The deer also weren't too skittish, which was cool. Neither were the skunks, which wasn't. This hike travels from roughly Payson near where we started to Camp Verde, near where we got picked up. We actually ended at the end of Bullpen Road, which used to be a fairly popular day camper location. In any event, suffice to say that the canyon itself didn't see many visitors. Now for a time frame as best as I can recollect. This would have been in 1977. I would have been 15 at the time. This has been in the back of my mind for that long, but to tell anybody, you must first join the ranks of the Looney Patrol. That's how you'll be viewed at any rate. All during the hike, we were paying attention to the critters, signs, spore, tracks. Several of us were self-described grizzly atoms, priding ourselves on our ability to identify animals by the evidence of their passing. About halfway through the hike, we came to what I recall was a mini meadow. It was a small patch of grass on a fairly stable slab of dirt, anchored upstream and downstream by large rocks. I thought at the time 
that this slab of soil, which was right next to the creek itself, should not have been so well seeded with grass and low shrubs, but I suspect the rocks offered at least some protection from the annual flood, at least enough to retain the soil, if not the plants thereon. At the edge of the soil, there was a small strip of mud beach at the water. About two feet back from the water and parallel to it was a large footprint, and I mean large and deep. By the way of comparison, my foot was used. I was about the biggest kid there, having a size 15 foot. Placing my foot next to the print, my boot would be about 70% of the size of the footprint. We had no ruler or tape measure, but I guesstimated it would have been 18 or 20 inches long. Big dude. I weighed about 220 pounds back then, so I got to be the depth tester too. I stepped in the mud between the print and the water. Even though where I stepped was wetter than where the print was, I left an impression of perhaps one-eighth of an inch deep, where we guesstimated the print itself to be almost half an inch deep. As said, a big dude. There was no drawing of the edges of the print, nor had the edges began to curl downward or slide back into the print. The grass crushed inside the print had begun to bend back up, so we guesstimated that the print was older than eight hours, but less than 24 hours old. We really wanted to take a calf, but of course we had no plaster and we couldn't think of a suitable substitute. We didn't have the time to wait in any event. Thankfully, the canyon went through a wide spot at that point and we couldn't stop to mess with the track. We had to make so many miles per day, so we had to press on after stalling there for about 30 minutes or so. We were very, very vigilant for the duration of that trip, I can assure you. We had to have walked right past it, either before we saw the track or afterward. Creepy, thinking that something that big might be staring at you from the brush or the canyon wall. We heard nothing and saw no other track. No hair, no scat, nothing we could attribute to the big critter. We tried, but even our overactive imagination could not come up with another bit of evidence. We were hiking roughly single file in a loose patrol formation. There were at best, as I can recall, six of us who saw the print. There is a very old story, much mutated and trumped on in the Patterson Strawberry area. By the time I was a kid, this story had become a good story to scare Boy Scouts with, but it was supposed to have been based on an old Indian legend of a creature which lived near the Mugion Rim. The core of the story involved a large hairy thing which rips people to bits. Allegedly, there is supposedly a reference in the very early days of the Payson Star, the newspaper there. Several cowhands were interviewed, and even the stories of some Indians were solicited. This story is about an attack on a rancher by some big hairy critter. I have never contacted the star to verify any of this. I would not be at all surprised to learn it is a 100% scare of Boy Scout stuff. On to the next one. My name is Justin. I'm 18 years old and I have lived in the mountains of the Cumberland Plateau all my life. Along with my best friend Zach, our hobbies include riding our four-wheelers in the woods of the mountains and on old logging roads throughout the plateau. This story begins the weekend when Zach and I went to our favorite place to ride, in the foothills. We unloaded our four-wheelers and gear at the place where most riders leave their trucks and trailers and headed off into the woods, following an old logging road. Driving our four-wheelers on an old logging road can be a real challenge. Most of the roads are washed out and very steep, but that is what makes it fun, challenging, and exciting until someone rolls their four-wheeler over and trashes it. Before I tell my story of what I had witnessed, I would like to describe my best friend and his personality. Zach and I had been best friends since kindergarten. He is a jokester, as is he accident-prone. When he would tell me certain things that seem a little off or did not make sense, I must wonder if he is joking or really telling me the truth. But since I have known him from the first day of kindergarten, I will be able to tell when he is joking and when he is not, most of the time. 
It had been raining the last few days before we went riding, and I knew the road would be washed out and the creeks that crossed the old logging road would be overflowing the banks, and it would be deep. That did not discourage us from trudging our ATVs through them. That is what made a fun ride. We headed down the familiar road when Zack, who was in the lead, stopped in front of me. I pulled up to him to question why he had stopped. He pointed at an overgrown road which looked like no one had drove on in a very long time. It was hidden by the overgrown trees and the leaves that camouflaged the tracks from the logging truck. The overgrown logging road went down into the valley where it looked as if the trees were old and had never been cut. I threw my thumb up for an okay sign and we turned to go down the newly discovered road. It was tough going down the steep hillside, but soon we were at the bottom of the mountain and in a very dense forest. It was a very beautiful place, but a little eerie too. The good thing about it was that we would be driving on level ground while exploring the area. It was early in the day, and we had plenty of time to follow the road before it became dark and would need to head back. Zack and I took off riding. We followed the narrow road. It had plenty of curves and small hills to climb, along with small creeks that crossed our path. We had been riding about an hour through the thick woods. I thought that maybe we needed to stop to turn around and go back to familiar territory, but my curiosity got the best of me and we continued to see where the road led us. Let me explain a little about the history around this part of Cumberland Plateau. This area that my buddies and I would ride our ATVs and rock crawlers is Cherokee Native American land. There are tons of very old abandoned rock houses scattered around the backwoods of the mountain. The Cherokee built their houses around the rivers that flowed through the forest and is also where they would hunt for their food. I have seen many of these houses as we were riding through. They are protected by the game wardens for this area. If anyone had been caught destroying one of these rock houses, they would be fined and would spend time in jail. Also, I cannot go without mentioning the backwoods moonshine seals that one might possibly run up on in the middle of nowhere, which is the very last thing anyone would want to do. It could be very dangerous. I wasn't surprised when we came up on a rock house at the end of the road that we were traveling. This rock house, surprisingly, was not in bad shape at all. It seemed that someone had repaired it looked to be in somewhat livable condition from where Zack and I had stopped. When I parked my ride, I retrieved my weapon. We never go out in the woods without some kind of protection and got off to investigate. I was a little weary about what I was going to find. If it was a moonshiner's house, I didn't want to be shot at or worse because I knew it would be hard, if not impossible, to get any help from where we were in these woods. As I approached the house, I knew it was abandoned because the roof was collapsed in. I motioned for Zack to follow me into the house. As we went in, I noticed that there were leaves and twigs piled up in one corner of the building. It looked as though someone or something was using the pile for a bed, kind of like a nest of some sort. We looked around for a little while longer and decided that we would have our lunch inside the small building and relax for a bit before heading back. I went out to the four-wheeler and brought our lunch bags and drinks in to eat and visit. Before we realized it, it was getting late in the evening and we decided we needed to be going in order to make it out of the woods before nightfall. The sun was setting low, the woods were getting dark, mosquitoes were coming out in droves, and the frogs and crickets started singing their songs. We gathered our belongings and headed toward the small doorway of the tiny rock house. We did not even make it outside before the whole forest became eerily quiet. I looked at Zack as he returned a look of concern. Zack is a big guy, and he doesn't scare easily but the area that surrounded us made us both feel uneasy and turned back to continue out the door. As we approached the door, we heard the loudest, deepest scream echo through the thick woods, just behind the rock house. 
We both froze in our tracks and my heart jumped into my throat. We both looked at each other and I noticed Zach was reaching for his weapon. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I should run to the four-wheeler or stay in the building. I could tell Zach was thinking the same thing. We chose to stay right there where we were once we heard the heavy footsteps coming closer to the small house. We couldn't see out of the building except for the opening of the doorway. There were no window slots at all. There was one way in and one way out. The footsteps were coming closer and we could hear growls with every step. I thought maybe it was a black bear coming closer to us but knew bears do not make loud screams that we had just heard. I was getting frightened, and I knew that Zack was not enjoying this either. I was worried with the weapons that we had, a thirty eight and a 9 millimeter pistol. I didn't think it would protect us from a bear attack. However, it's what we had, and we had to make the best of it. I peeked out of the opening doorway and noticed how far we had parked the four-wheelers from the building. I wondered why we had not parked closer to the house. I guess at the time we had arrived, we didn't think we would need to be running for our lives to reach them. Zack and I, with our weapons drawn, stood silently inside the rock house, listening to the footsteps getting closer and closer to us. My heart was racing, and my only thought was that I hoped it wasn't a huge bear coming toward us. Then thought I also hoped it wasn't a moonshiner either. I hope we are not trespassing on or invading his property. Either way, we were in a tough situation. The sun was no longer shining and we found ourselves in the dark. The only light we had was a small flashlight that I kept hooked on my belt loop. I thought to myself I would only turn it on when absolutely needed because I had no idea how long the battery would last. We could still hear the footsteps slowly walking closer to the building and coming around toward the doorway. Zack and I took our stance to pounce on anyone or anything that would come into sight. As soon as the footsteps came to the edge of the building, they stopped. I was completely still, and holding my breath, just praying that whatever it was would go away into the woods so we could make our escape. That is when we heard a low, deep growl on the other side of the wall. The hair on the back of my neck stood straight up, and my hands started to shake. I have never heard of an animal that would make such a growl like that. It sounded unearthly. I looked into Zack's wide, terror-filled eyes and tried to think of what to do next. We were in the worst place to be attacked by something. With only one way out of the building, we knew we were cornered and would have to fight for our lives. To my relief, we heard the footsteps of the animal turn and begin to walk away from the rock house. I thought maybe we might be able to escape when it left. As Zack and I exhaled and began to calm down, I tried to think of a plan to get out of the house when we heard another loud scream coming from the front of the house. Then we heard what sounded like two rocks being hit together and something hitting against a tree. Three loud knocks or bangs on a tree in front of us, and then three from behind us. I guess it sounded loud to us because the woods were so quiet, and all we could hear was the knocks. After the knocks, everything was silent. No footsteps, no leaves rustling, no knocks, and no growls. We thought we were finally safe, and I was ready to leave. I looked at Zack, and I knew he was ready to bolt out the door and jump on the four-wheelers to get out of there. As soon as we were about to leave, all hell broke loose, and we started to be attacked. Huge rocks started to hit the sides of the building, coming over the walls and landing near our feet. Large trees that were close to the sides of the building were being ripped up and thrown to the ground, and the loud screams from the creatures were heard echoing throughout the woods. Zack and I huddled in a corner in order not to be hit by the rocks and tree limbs that were falling all around us. It was a nightmare. But when one of the tree limbs hit me, I looked up and saw through the doorway a shadow running toward our ATVs. I panicked. That was my ride out of here. I couldn't let anything happen to my four-wheeler. I jumped up and ran toward the doorway and turned on my flashlight toward the enormous shadow. That's when I saw what it was. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a moonshiner either.
It was something that I never had believed in. It was a Bigfoot. Even though it was dark and I could not see very well with my small flashlight, I know what I saw. It was a creature that was about seven feet tall, broad-shouldered, and covered in dark-colored hair. I couldn't tell exactly what color it was. I just know it was dark with black-colored eyes, a flat nose, no neck, and a huge body. My flashlight was shining in the face of a Bigfoot. At that moment, time had slowed down, and I thought I was going to pass out. When the Bigfoot turned toward me with its lips purged into a snarl, I thought that this was the end of my life, and I would be lost forever in these woods. As I stared at the Bigfoot and it stared back at me, I felt like I was in a dream. A dream I would wake up from at any moment and the nightmare would be over. I don't know how long I was standing there looking at the Bigfoot creature when suddenly I heard a gunshot coming from behind me and I watched as the creature ran off into the woods. I turned around and found Zack right behind me with his weapon pointed toward the sky and smoke coming from his 9mm. He also saw the creature close to our four-wheelers and knew it was our only means of escape. We stayed in the rock house for a little while longer to make sure that the Bigfoot was not planning on coming back to attack us again. I guess we were scared to leave the safety of the walls and be exposed on our four-wheelers with any type of protection around us. After a little while, the frogs and crickets started to sing again and the woods seemed to be back to normal. Zack and I waited until daylight before we left the rock house to venture home. As we walked carefully out of the building and towards our ride, we noticed there were huge footprints all over the place in varied sizes. I don't know how many Bigfoots were there that night, but I knew it was more than one. We made it out of the woods and into familiar territory, but I was ready to be out of the woods altogether for good. That was the last time I went ATV riding in the woods of the Cumberland Plateau Mountains. I sold my four-wheeler and moved into the valley in a small town away from the mountains. I'm happy where I live now and do not wish to go back to my old stomping grounds anytime soon. This was an experience that has dramatically changed my life, and I will never forget a second of it. On to the next one. Near Riverton in Ripley County in Missouri. About seven years ago, some friends and I went camping at a lake called Forge Lake. The lake is a small, secluded lake, about 10 acres or so, and not very heavily used in the Mark Twain National Forest. There is one road in and about three to five miles off the highway. So I can't imagine anyone out there, and if they came down the road, we would have heard them unless they walked, and it would have been a long walk. We were all sitting around the campfire talking, and something came running out of the woods, just out of the distance of the light of our campfire, and ran down toward the lake, where the moonlight was fairly bright. It ran around that area for a while, almost like it was running circles, like it was confused. It also was waving its arms and making a very strange noise. Then it ran back in the woods. Its appearance was different from most that other people report. It was about four feet tall, like a baby Bigfoot. It was on two legs and very stocky, and the sounds it made were not like any of those I've heard before. Not like any of the Bigfoot noises I've heard online. A few years back, I was watching TV. There was a show about Bigfoot. They had some audio of sounds much like the ones I've heard online. But there was a man in Colorado that had a recording that was different. He had it tested by some scientists, and he said it was something unexplainable but it sounded just like what I heard. Now, I don't know what I heard or saw was a Bigfoot, but I know I can't explain it. I have done a lot of camping and hunting before and since this, and I have never seen or heard anything like it. We looked for prints in the morning, 
but the ground was pretty hard and found nothing. I believe there were seven of us. We were just sitting around and talking. It was somewhere between midnight and probably three in the morning. There was a full moon and in a clear opening. I believe it was a pine forest, but not for positive. It may have been just regular oak forest. It was near a small lake. This area is not at all heavily populated and quite a ways from the nearest house. On to the next one. My wife and I were living in a small park trailer, 8 by 30 feet, on our 10-acre lot in the north of Forsyth, Missouri. The area is isolated, almost entirely underdeveloped, and composed of heavily forested 10-acre lots. Access to the area was, at that time, a rather narrow dirt gravel road, which was barely able to handle two-way traffic. The area supports a wild variety of wildlife, including possum, raccoons, bobcat, foxes, coyotes, and a large deer population. Black bears, small and scraggly, are relatively rare, but are reportedly making a comeback in the area and appear to be moving from Arkansas to the south. Both my wife and I had been to work very early that day and were quite tired. We were lying in our bedroom at the western end of the trailer with the windows open, reading before turning in for the night. We had a small reading lamp turned on. There was still some light outside, but the sun had just dropped below the horizon and trees. We suddenly heard a long, drawn-out scream that was very reminiscent of a woman in fear or in pain. Our two dogs began barking fiercely and jumping against their compound fence behind our trailer. The long cry was repeated, this time with an upward shift in tone toward the end, and I was reminded of the call of a peacock. I asked my wife what she thought it was, and it did sound like a peacock. She used to work at an amusement park where peacocks roamed freely, and she said that it was most definitely not a peacock call. When the scream sounded a third time, both of us immediately came to the conclusion that someone was in trouble, and we headed for the door. I carried a big, multi-cell flashlight and went out the front door facing south, while my wife stayed by the door, telephone in hand, prepared to dial 911 should the need arise. The only clearing that we had done on the entire property was the long driveway back to our trailer site. The actual clearing needed for a trailer itself, and the small amount of additional land cleared that was required for a well house, and access by the well drillers for their large trucks. I moved westward, perhaps a hundred feet to the far side of the driveway clearing. There are no street lights in the area, and with the sun directly below the horizon, darkness was falling rapidly. I shone the beam of the flashlight across the forested area from which the screaming had come, sweeping it slowly left and right. There was a shuffling noise about fifty feet further west amid a stand of several large cedars and oak trees. I swung the light to the spot where the sound seemed to originate, and a dark shape moved behind the biggest of the trees. At the extreme range of the light beam, I was alarmed to see two red-orange reflected eyes looking directly at me. No other details were apparent except for a generic dark shadow. The two eyes were at a point well above the expected face height for a normal adult human. They blinked once or twice, then vanished, as if the owner either clothed them fully or turned away. It was growing darker by the second, and the only clearly visible area was the cleared driveway and the partially cleared walk to the trailer. All else was in deep shadow. The shuffling noise came again, and a big shadow moved quickly toward the southwest, from behind the trees where I had seen the eyes. I attempted to use the flashlight to see the owner of the eyes, but could only see a tall shadow. 
It moved at a run, upright, and I initially thought it must be a tall, heavy set man. I was still thinking that the screams had come from a female and that this must be her attacker. However, there was no one else in that area at the time. The ten acre lot to the east and west of ours were unoccupied and completely undeveloped. While there is one house to the south across the access road, it is set back from the road and was dark. The occupants were not home at the time. There were no further calls, screams, or noises in the forest, and our dogs ceased jumping against the fence, but continued to bark and whine in an agitated manner for another 10 to 15 minutes. I returned to the house and reported what I'd seen to my wife. Without additional information, we decided that a call to 911 was not advisable. Within a week, we were attending a gathering at the Ozark Mountain Indian Heritage Association and recounted the incident to several men in the group. More than one described having experienced similar encounters with such an animal, and one man in particular mentioned that he had actually attempted to give chase with his hunting dog. The dogs got fairly close to where he suspected the animal was hiding, but then returned to him, tails tucked and whining, refusing to pursue it further. He too noticed that the eye reflected red-orange in a flashlight. After that, I made it a habit to have a fully loaded Marlin 3030 by the bedside, but the incident was never repeated. We have not seen or heard anything similar since the original incident. The area is now more populated, all the lot having been sold or occupied, and several of the neighbors have free-roaming dogs. The deer and coyote population is either greatly reduced or they have gone elsewhere to avoid the neighbor's dogs. We still have possum and raccoons, but they too are far less frequent to the area. Note, the air was still. There was no wind. I did not detect any unusual scent, although there was obviously enough for our two dogs to detect as they were highly agitated. On to the next one. East of Ulrich, Missouri, in Henry County. It was just after dusk. Five friends and I had just went into the woods, just inside the tree line. There's a lot of deer hunters around. They have been shooting all day. We were standing there when these two high-pitched screams came from the woods maybe an eighth of a mile away from us. We all froze, looked at each other, and then started talking again. They are all hunters like me, but comments came like, wow, what was that? I've never heard anything like it before. But I kept quiet, not saying anything, because I have heard it before. I kept waiting for another scream, but there was none. I watched the tree line for the rest of the evening, nothing. But I was scared the same. We were standing in the woods, talking shooting bull. It was a clearing around a house in a heavily wooded area next to a house five miles away. On to the next one. In Jefferson County in Missouri, I was driving east on Hillsboro Hematite Road to go mushroom hunting. Coming into a curve to my left, I noticed what I first thought was a person. As I got closer, I saw that it was not a person, but a large, hump-shouldered, black animal shuffling across the road to the north side. It was taller than first thought at six foot, and it started running into a cedar tree thicket. It swung its arms as it walked like an ape. I stopped the car where it crossed and rolled down my window and turned off my engine and tried to hear it going away, but heard no sound. Went to mushroom hunting spot and did not stop at sight on the way home as I felt it would be taking a chance. It was 5.30 a.m. and good light. Clear morning in a hilltop glade between two large valleys. There are freshwater springs in the area as well as oak trees of hickory and cedar. 
On to the next one. Near Jefferson City in Callaway County in Missouri. My ex-girlfriend and I were bored one day, so we went for a leisurely drive. She was driving down Old Highway 94 in Callaway County. We were two-ish miles down the road when I see a huge brown object 20-ish feet off the side of the road in the yard of a house that no one lived in. I see a humanoid creature on its hand and knees in front of a big round hay bale. The left arm is straight down. The right arm is extended, picking up something off the ground. The right knee is straight down, left leg extended as if to counterbalance itself. I saw it so clearly that i seen the expression on its face. Soft-looking, lighter brown hair on the face with a black nose. From a profile angle, it was totally engrossed in what it was picking up off the ground. From the extended arm, I saw long, darker brown hair, maybe 12 inches long, blowing in the wind. The hair was not matted and seemed to be clean and shiny. I quickly surveyed the surroundings to get an idea of the size of the thing. Its extended arm stretched maybe two feet in front of the hay bale. The extending leg was probably three and a half feet the other way. Its back was flush with the top of the hay bale. I was unable to speak for a couple of seconds. When I regained control of my vocal cords, I told my girlfriend about what I saw. She looked in the rearview mirror and saw the creature by the hay bale, then exclaimed she was turning around. Some cuss words followed with the threat to throw her out of the car if she stopped. The creature didn't even seem to notice us or care about anything but whatever it was doing. We were in a small car and who knows what would have happened if we startled the thing and it came after us. It was a summer day around 11 a.m. Lots of stories about a Bigfoot in the area dating back to the 60s. On to the next one. Illuminated eyes aren't the only mysterious light seen in conjunction with Bigfoot. Various reports describe the creature breathing fire, swinging lanterns, or, strangest of all, the creatures themselves glowing. Folklore is, of course, fraught with mysterious lights in the night. Will-o'-wisps, ghost lights, fairy lanterns, witch lights, entities carrying torches, and more populate supernatural tales worldwide. It is unsurprising Bigfoot should follow suit. Time and again, witnesses report Sasquatch leading, following, or otherwise accompanying various unexplained light phenomena. When wild men self-illuminate, witnesses most often describe their eyes glowing. Other facial features, however, exude light as well. The wild man of Welsh Mountain in Berks County, Pennsylvania, was portrayed in 1885 as rushing over the rocks and ravines of the mountains on all fours, his eyes glaring wildly, fire blazing from his nostrils, and his mouth foaming with gore and fury. Another wild man, described as a fearsome apparition, appeared in Claremont, California in early March 1910. He was noted to be a raging wild man with a mouth aflame, gloating eyes, and clad in upholstery of waving hair, who has tormented the mind and inspired the fears of those of the Claremont district. In rare cases, the entire body of Sasquatch glows. On November 30th, 1966, a woman was changing a tire on a rural road near Brooksville, Florida, when a gigantic, hairy, bipedal creature with large green eyes approached her. The entire creature emitted an eerie green glow as well. In another instance, a man named Randall wrote to a paranormal radio program to report a family of glowing Bigfoot. He witnessed the creatures walking out of the woods near his family home in Madison, New Jersey in 1969. According to Randall, the creatures were raiding nearby gardens and glowed with what Randall called a radiating energy of a multi-dimensional nature. A lantern-carrying spirit is one of the most persistent American ghost story motifs, appearing in seaside lore of the East Coast, tales of railroad hauntings, and phantom car accidents. 
Surprisingly, the specters of large, hairy ape men also carry lantern in local legend. Block Island, off the coast of Rhode Island, was haunted by its old wild man in 1888. He appears in the dead of night in a wild, untenanted hollow of the hill, to which the throbbing of the ocean comes as a witch-like murmur. He digs a hole in the brittle peat, the swinging of a spectral light is seen in the drifting mist. The islanders go out to find him. They stumble upon the hole, but the swinging light dances away over the hills with the illusions of an ignis fatus. Seven employees of the local power company were sent to repair a Middlebrook, Virginia power line one night late March 1978. They noticed a tall, hairy biped standing in a field rapidly moving toward the nearby tree line. The creature appeared to glide across the ground, holding an object to its chest resembling a red flashlight before disappearing into the trees. Lantern-carrying wild men appear internationally in Australia. Three different groups of motorists witnessed a yowie carrying a lantern. In June of 1975, in Talem Bend, Australia, the witnesses saw the large, hairy biped carrying an illuminated device alongside the road. One group of motorists said they saw the creature carrying a lantern as well as another light in a nearby field. Despite these loose trends, anomalous lights associated with Bigfoot commonly defy categorization. A handful of the most curious odds and ends. In spring of 1975, a woman near San Juan, Puerto Rico, heard her guard dogs barking at something in her backyard. She looked out to see a large, ape-like creature sitting atop a tall plum tree. The creature glared at the witness with eyes that seemed to emit fire. The creature then began to shrink, assuming a spherical shape in the process and started glowing. Finally, it took the form of a glowing sphere about the size of a basketball and then slowly floated away into the sky. On September 11, 1985, a man was fishing near Shenandoah, Virginia when he saw a seven-foot Bigfoot running along the bank. The creature moved faster than any animal the witness had ever seen. The fisherman fired at the creature, hitting it in the chest. The Bigfoot stopped and stared at the witness, a blue light shining from the bullet wound. The terrified witness fled the scene. One night in October of 1977, in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, a man came home to find his dog killed and hanging by its neck. His house was illuminated by a light from an unknown source. The man then witnessed an eight-foot-tall, hairy, bipedal creature. He shot the Bigfoot, but the bullet bounced off seemingly without effect, after which the creature let out a scream and ran away. A mysterious white light accompanied a Bigfoot sighting in Trafford, Pennsylvania on January 10, 1980. The light was seen by a group of young boys who also reported a tall creature covered in reddish-brown hair, possessed of red glowing eyes and smelling sulfurous. The boys watched the creature retreat to the woods where they heard branches breaking. Something, presumably the creature, then threw stones from the woods. On the evening of July 20th, 1980, Witnesses spotted an unusual blue light hovering in a field in Gulfrey, Pennsylvania. In Gulfrey, Pennsylvania, they simultaneously observed a tall, hairy creature in the same area. The creature ran away on two legs, breathing heavily. The Sykesville monster was a Bigfoot creature reported around Sykesville, Maryland in the early 1980s. In the spring of 1982, Willard McIntyre fired upon the creature with no apparent effect. Instead of appearing wounded, the Bigfoot turned and hit McIntyre with a ball of light. By the early 1980s, Steve Stover, a longtime Bigfoot investigator from Maryland, decided the creature must represent something more than a relic hominid or an undiscovered primate. Specifically, he believed they might be interdimensional beings. While investigating a farm known for recurring activity in Harford County, Dover brought a psychic with him. 
he asked the psychic to try to contact the Bigfoot creature while he observed. During her attempts at dusk, he saw two huge eyes, white, glowing eyes in a dark shape moving down the hillside beyond the farmhouse. The assumed creature moved into a thicket where Stover lost sight of it. As he scanned the area trying to find the creature, Stover caught a blinking light and heard a loud hum. He became frightened and asked the psychic to end the experiment. Bigfoot indicates something far bigger than what we understand at present, Stover later said. He may be our way into the next frontier, into other dimensions. Luger Penamosa, Spain, experienced a wave of animal mutilations in 1985. In September, several witnesses awakened by their barking dogs watched multiple six-foot-tall balls of light silently drifting around their property. Small, ape-like creatures walked next to the spheres. Though multiple shots were fired at the creatures and the orbs, they displayed no apparent effect. In May 1995, a Cascade County, Montana hunter encountered an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot with glowing red eyes. He fired at the creature, which disappeared in a flash of light. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!